Thanks. Nice to see you guys again. Good to see you. And OB. Okay. So um, you're missing Tony. Otherwise, one, two, three, four. We're on. We're We're missing Tony. All right. Let's go ahead and kick off. It is Monday, December 2nd at 434. I'll call this meeting the Planning Commission to order. We'll begin with citizens to be heard. We have no public hearings on the agenda. So if you are here to make a comment, now is your opportunity. Is there anyone who wanted to make a statement during citizens to be heard? Or if you're just here to listen, um, that's also perfectly fine. All right. Well, there's only one person in the Zoom that would be in that category. So for whatever reason they end up coming off with me, we'll, we'll come back to this. So we will move on. Um, Presentations. We don't have any presentations. Uh, ex parte communications and disclosures. So, again, we don't have any public hearings on the agenda. But in terms of any of these open discussion items, does anybody have anything to disclose? Seeing none, we will move on to reviewing and approving our meeting minutes of November 20th. Any comments? I'll entertain a motion to adopt. I move that we approve the minutes. Okay, so second, seconded by Maketa. All in favor? Uh, yeah. Wonderful. Um, and Jenna, uh, great job with those minutes, by the way. Thank you. And uh, they there as well. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, let's move on to county commission updates. I don't really have anything. <laughs> I mean, we talked about the um, Title 17 regarding um, air traffic noise. There was a huge amount of input, both online calls. They said they got 54 calls in one day because somebody had placed a number on Facebook, which I will state that it's just not the, this is kind of for the general public. It's not the most effective way to communicate communicate with the commission. It's better to put it into the public comment because then it's actually housed and put into an Excel spreadsheet, et cetera, and so on. Um, so a lot of feedback on that. And we tabled it. And the goal is, I think, to go back with key stakeholders, players, and discuss it. And so we'll just see how it goes. That's sure. where we sit. I, yeah. Oh, I watched that meeting. Yeah. So. Another, a lot of, not a lot of fun, but it's 
is. Um, I do think we're going to move forward. You know, if the BLM is not going to be proactive about putting something into place, um, then I think the county will be, and hopefully they'll then follow. Okay. Any questions for Trish? Maybe just a comment, just on, yeah. our, on what I've observed over the last yeah. few meetings from the planning commission and yeah. county commission. Um, just seeing that I don't, just an observation yeah, no, it's great. that things have felt really rushed and stakeholders are yep. feeling completely overlooked. And so yep. just to state that as an observation, I'm glad that we've kind of tabled and slowed down this workforce housing ordinance. Yeah. Because um, I'm like, I think we have three strikes in. Yeah, right. I agree. That, so. Yeah. Um, yep. It's what I'm glad to see is, is more awareness. Um, so for example, with the workforce housing, I was revisiting how we got to here and there have been multiple public meetings, public workshops, right. votes to engage the EA in the first place, which isn't to at all discount your point. I think we need to find a balance. We need yeah. to find a balance of bringing people in earlier in the process. Yes. Um, and just the term that I often use with my team that I mentor is steal the critique in the sense of, you know, just get out ahead of what would be a very reasonable critique of the process yeah. by improving okay. the process. Yeah. And you know, one of the things we're gonna talk about tonight, I think is gonna help. Great. But us it's you know, no. uh, there's also responsibility yeah. of sort of um, getting involved earlier and how do we make that more yeah. visible to no. the community. Yeah, and I th and I think that was yeah, one of the I agree. And I agree with your statement. Um, and it right, how do we disseminate it? information more effectively, um, making it as easy, easy as possible, because we are hearing like, well, I don't, can't see where the agendas are, which I think is pretty obvious, but it, we have to just make it up front. Here are the agendas, here's what we're doing, um, here's where you can make public comment as easy as possible. As so as people, people do feel heard. The agenda center remains broken. It's right. It's really hard to find a packet online. Oh. Yeah. It and even if you know what you're looking, it is yeah. it's hard. Okay. And and like I think too, and I don't know if we want to table this for a more in-depth discussion, but I think it would be useful to put together some strategies of how how we can really simplify things, whether it's like having a one pager that that is the home yeah. page that says, you know, maybe it's like an annual calendar that says if you're if you care about this, right, you know. Pay attention, you know, like we're coming into the budget season for the commission. Right. That's like yeah. probably the most important yeah. thing on a yearly basis yeah. um, to really get in there and scrutinize it. Uh, yeah. when... And it, it, in some ways, is the joy of Grand County Connects. It, you know, it would be really nice as that gets more and more well known. You want information about the county, you want an agenda, you want to, know, you want to be able to make comments, go to Grand County Connect. Right. Um, okay. Very no, helpful. All of this feedback is great. Um, I haven't checked recently, but is there an obvious link to Grand County Connect somewhere on Grand County's website? I think it's on the home page, isn't it? The okay, page? cool. It is now. Great. I just haven't looked recently. It's been a few months since I looked, so. Yeah, it's a little, not very obvious. It looks it's, like a graphic on the home page right. of the website currently. We're going to change it. Yeah, we need to put it more front and center. That's a good thing we could do easily. Grand so, County TikTok. Yeah. Is that coming up? Like, do you I, think, but I don't um, think it would be a bad thing for planning and zoning and the county um, administrator's office to put the packets out. You know, I'm just trying to show you. I think we're going to start doing that. Okay. Right. Yeah. I think Alicia is taking over kind of a social media, you know, position too that's going to become part of the position. Yeah. They start getting information. Um, following the November 28th meeting, because um, the way that that even came before the planning commission left, oh, so commissioners feeling sort of where did where did you know this come from in front of us? Um, oh, okay. So was so kind to put together an FAQ, which is on it's on Grand County right. Connect. Right. Yep, it's um, so it's available online and it goes through how we got to the public hearing, the steps that were taken, where it originated from, it summarizes at a high level. And I think, you know, this may not be necessary or viable for every single thing that comes before us, but certainly for things that we need to be more controversial, given comments ahead of time, um, I think it would be great to have something like this, but I'll also know your office is already slammed. So, you know, that's something that I can help as well as working.
outsourcing that. Yeah. Um, I think anything we can do because many of us are mail or you know, we're, we're valid in the sense that <coughs> And, and, and you know, it's usually not because it related to city post shop. Yeah, you know, there was confusion right. about you know, but, but it's interesting, you know, we have news, we have rice, we have you know, right. it's amazing what we do have on hand. Yeah. <laughs> so let's move on actually on that same note. Formation of the subcommittee to collect public input and revise noise related images for that case. So let me give a little context to this. Um, following the 28th, the meeting on the 28th, um, I reached out to um, Chairman Hadler with my recommendation that I use my, in our bylaws as the chair, I can appoint people to a committee. And so we have the ability to do that. I recommended that um, it would be a great next step to assertively seek input and also um, have that open discussion with the public um, related to this noise ordinance, not with the intent of starting from scratch, not with the intent of derailing the goals, which are laid out in the general plan very clearly of reducing on site and on road noise, uh, but being more intentional about it and also capturing ideas that maybe had come to the table before and that are no longer viable or were overlooked. Um, I'll just say I've um, sort of just uh, temperature checked this with a few people who represent a real spectrum on this issue and found um, pretty consistent support for um, having a discussion. And I know you reached out and talked to some people too. I'm sure we're not the only ones. I also attended the Motorized Trails Committee meeting last week um, and spoke to their chair, so Koontz, who also was in favor of this. So let me just go ahead and read through this summary um, and give a little context and then just kind of see what comes next. So, um, you know, as a planning body, we really are and should be governed by our general plan, which was the large planning effort that has happened in the community over the last year. And there are multiple references to noise, but the two that are most uh, pertinent to this discussion are uh, 1.6.3 related to reducing road noise and 6.5.2 uh, related to reducing the noise impact where you have the um, commercial or highway commercial uh, abutting residential land. <clears throat> and we also know that, um, you know, we do get concerns um, communicated to the commission and to the police department and to the city council. And it's not specific to any one use, it's specific to noise. And there's many different types of use that are behind a lot of those complaints. So we know that there is citizen interest in reducing this noise. Um, so it's obvious that we need to do more work and we wanna make sure that people are heard and feel like they're part of the solution, especially where um, you know something could have a, a potential impact on their business. And we don't want to um, certainly be seen, but also in, in reality, we don't wanna make decisions without working with people who represent our business community and our residential community, which works one on the like. Okay, that's me talking. It's all in the summary, but here's what I think is the most important thing. Um, my proposal is that we bring this group together with a very short timeline. Um, two meetings in January, one to sort of collect and sort through and assess um, ideas and input that we have heard in the past that may come in now or that we might be able to bring to the table as a group, to uh, advise planning and zoning on specific recommendations related to the draft that was presented on the 28th. Some of the things that have already come up are there's a lot of things mashed together. Does this need to be two different ordinances with two different purposes? Since it seems like they were very sort of um, arbitrarily collapsed together, maybe. Um, also, there have been, even just in sort of the uh, uh, conversations I've had, some really innovative ideas coming out of the, the broad community from all sides, including outfitters that um, I, I think could be really positive. And I do think that there's an opportunity here to move forward together. Um, hopefully that would put planning and zoning staff in a position to uh, draft a revision for this group to then be the first point of review later in January, one more round of revisions by planning and zoning staff, and then that could come before the planning commission sometime in early to mid February for the planning and zoning or the planning commission hearing which then based off that recommendation, we go to the county commission. So that's the thought there. Um, 
There were several members of the motorized trails committee who have already volunteered to participate, representing different types of use, um, OHV, dirt bike, and um, Jeep. And I've talked to some members of the public just broadly, not about this kind of issue in specifics, but who have expressed an interest in being part of that conversation. Uh, Aaron, I hit you up on the phone the other day when we chatted to see if you'd be interested. I don't know if there's another member of the planning commission that would be interested in serving on that. Hopefully it's a fairly light commitment. And, uh, I'd, I'd, and I'd be happy to, this is Obi speaking, but. Okay, so uh, I, I would like to serve and then um, we'll ask Obi and Erin. Does anyone have any concerns with that makeup from the planning commission? And that doesn't stop anyone from attending, but this will just sort of for the sake of some ability to get things done, keeping it to a, a predetermined group. Um, what we will do is there's a sample input in here. I just drafted this. So if anyone wants to recommend any revisions, I would love to hear them, please. Um, as well as on the timeline or, or anything in here. My hope is that we can actually send this out through planning and zoning, through motorized trails committee has offered to extend this information out to their network. I've talked to some members of the outfitting community who have um, expressed some interest in increasing public awareness. We'll ask if people want to participate, they email planning at grandcountycommission.net. Grand County, what did I write? See, this is why I shouldn't write things on Saturday mornings. Grand County, Utah. Okay. Nope, it's not. <laughs> That's right, we'll fix it. Thank you. Um, so, but Elisa, the planning and zoning department, which is also, you can Google planning Grand County and find their email. Um, then what we can do is look through that list, contact people, get that group formed and have our first meeting in early January. Which if you're not able to participate, if you're out of town, because I know you said you're gone till the 12th, right? So right. express I, some I interest. Fly back in okay. So, you know, we'll have a Zoom link if people want to participate if there's, or opportunities to listen in and contribute. It's not going to be gated. It's just that way we can kind of keep things on the rails for decision making purposes. Okay. Anyone have any comments on that? Again, this is me sort of, you know, throwing one over the wall. So I really love to hear any any thoughts or ideas that maybe wasn't captured here or any edits to this approach. I ended up yeah. going over to High Point talking with the guys over there. They seem, you know, you guys are super open and had good ideas. And I also think, I mean, I mean, a lot of your, some of your ideas had extended beyond what land use can do. Um, right. I gave, there, there's a program through USU called Transforming Communities Institute. I gave both your guys emails. They, uh, they have money and resources to like give communities and like, hey, we'll do studies for you stuff. I don't know if you've gotten, Melissa said she hasn't gotten that email yet, but I was trying to be like, hey, yeah, we'll use your resource so, right. with that. So. Right. I appreciate it. Okay. Sorry, I've been out for a week. I didn't get to read much because I was at surgery. So today was my first day back in office. So um, even though I don't formally need a motion, I actually would like to just get this on the table just for the sake of forming a committee. It's something we've really done formally before. So I was going to do this by um, unanimous cons consent. So essentially, it's if there's no objections, I will form this temporary committee on land use noise uh, and direct the planning and zoning department to send out communication about how to get involved with the intent to appoint members by the end of this year and have our first meeting in early January. So no one's opposed. We'll go ahead and report that one. Good. All right. Um, we had citizens to be heard. I know you guys were a little late. If you wanted to make a comment, just because this is relevant, um, this would be your opportunity, and I'd be happy to extend that to you for like three minutes each. No pressure if you don't want to. Okay, so we will go ahead and move on uh, to a discussion item on workforce housing solutions. All right, so. <clears throat> Just going to be a summary of the staff report. Um, so over the past year, we've been working towards understanding the economic roots of the housing crisis and what policies may be necessary to meet demand today and at various stages of potential future economic growth. 
Grand County's market is distinct in this state, unlike other recreation and amenities based communities such as Park City. We do not have bedroom communities or nearby access to a large metropolitan area that we can rely on for in commuters to fill jobs or other community needs. So we do have a unique situation here in our, in our area where we don't have the nearby communities. And I hopefully, ideally, we wouldn't really want to have to relegate our workforce to living outside of the community in which they work anyway, even if we did have those that situation. Um, so uh, just to kind of provide a little background and put our efforts into context, um, we were thinking about our workforce housing solutions as kind of a toolbox. So we have, we want to implement many different tools. Not one tool is going to um, fix the housing crisis on its own. So to date, um, the county has developed and implemented a couple different initiatives um, that we are seeing kind of going into on the ground currently. One of those is the high density housing overlay pilot program. And the other one is the alternative dwelling overlay pilot program. Both policies target the increase of local workforce housing by one, allowing a wide spectrum of housing types to be built in new developments in order to fit the needs of various households by size and income. And two, by increasing the pool of deep restricted units for actively employed households or otherwise known as workforce housing, workforce uh, local residents, which ensures that local residents have a shot at buying or renting a home because they aren't having to compete with outside investors or second home vacation home buyers on a wildly inflated housing market. As homes come online through these pilot programs, the county is tracking the successes and shortcomings so that we can better implement similar initiatives or expand upon these existing programs. So going forward, the county is looking at what other tools we can utilize to provide housing for our local workforce. Um, ultimately, as I said, we do have to implement a variety of solutions um, to determine the nexus between new development and increased demand for workforce housing. The county contracted with BAE Urban Economics in September of this year. BAE also conducted a housing nexus study for the county and city jointly in 2018 and for the city in 2021 to provide the basis for their actively employed households ordinance. So the preliminary results of the housing study we've just gotten in mid-November. Um, so we're kind of just now analyzing those results and figuring out what to do with the data. Um, but basically the, the preliminary results demonstrate that in order to accommodate the induced workforce housing demand based on build out capacity of non-residential development in the unincorporated county, the county would need to set aside a portion of future residential development capacity for workforce occupancy. So county is, staff is in the process of drafting um, a land use code update to implement a new use parameter for residential zoning districts in which a certain percentage of units proposed in new residential developments would be deed restricted for local workforce occupancy and ownership. This is similar to MOAP's recently adopted actively employed households ordinance, um, but it would be more broadly implemented in the county. Um, the percentage of the workforce housing requirement units that, that would be uh, determined for a set aside um, would be uh, determined, sorry, I'm using that word too many times, by a combination of data provided by the housing nexus analysis and the input from local builders and developers and other stakeholders. So we're just in the process now of um, wanting to reach out to stakeholders develop and the development community to get more of that input. Um, we had uh, a close to a final draft of a land use code amendment that's really just based on the data and all the research we've done. Um, so at this point, we want to get that kind of on the ground feedback. Um, the other idea that we have, and I haven't gotten word from our consultant, who is also on the on the Zoom meeting is to possibly work with them um, to conduct a, a feasibility analysis, which is part of this whole process is kind of finding out, does it actually work out? So working with local developers and the consultant to maybe come up with um, an actual uh, 
you know, go through a hypothetical uh, scenario of a development that, that we could figure out what the shortcomings or successes could be. Um, Can I ask so, a question on that real quick? Or yeah. I'm happy to hold questions. So I'm almost done actually. Yeah. Beyond implementation of the new workforce housing ordinance, the county is looking to develop other solutions, including increasing opportunities for multifamily development through newly established future land use designations and zoning districts with the development of our future land use map and to improve and expand upon the density bonus incentives we already have in our land use code. So staff's recommendation to today is to um, just provide direction on you know, where we're going with this effort, that workforce housing uh, use parameter ordinance, and what should we be asking developer community and suggestions for getting meaningful safe, stakeholder input going forward. Steve? You mentioned the feasibility study. Uh, I think that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Definitely should do that. Just curious, what sorts of scenarios would you be looking for them to, to dive into? Yeah, I mean, I think it would be like your like a typical it's something based on what we've been getting applications for for new subdivisions you know like a I need to go back and look at what are some of the recent applications we may have been for subdivisions i mean we haven't had a lot of recent subdivision proposals that are more than like what five acres so but i mean you know they they could be coming 20, 20 acre lot subdivision, 40 acre lot subdivision. There's a lot of that out there. That's, yeah, there's a lot of um, development potential still in the valley. So um, yeah, I think it would be good to look at maybe a couple different size subdivisions. I don't know. Aaron, do you want to add to that idea of a feasibility analysis? Yeah, thanks, Lisa. Um, under our current scope of work, we are contracted to evaluate at least four different development prototypes as part of the incentives analysis. So that would involve developing uh, static financial pro forma models for at least four different types of development at the county's discretion. So you'd have, you know, you'd be able to direct us to look at certain types of of housing production or possibly even um, non-residential development if the proposed policy goes in that direction as well. We'd be looking at the impact of the policy itself on feasibility as well as uh, opportunities for possible incentives and offsetting concessions, things like density bonuses and whatnot that can improve financial feasibility of a project while offsetting the uh, induced cost effect of the workforce housing policy. I guess I have any discussion on the county commission regarding the HDHA cap because I know in regards to the we've had a few applications come before us and no, no. we've been talking about the possibility of the HDHO not necessarily needing to be opened up or expanded when we get to the point of implementing multifamily for real, right? Like actually adopting new zoning districts that would have pretty much the same levels of density as the HGHO that do it in our future land use map. Mm -hmm. And then it would be just a rezoning process, just like the HGHO was. It was a rezone application to get the overlay. But in this case, it would just be a rezone application to an actual zoning designation that exists in our land use code. I guess I'd go ahead. How many additional what is the like the how many additional possible residential units do you anticipate coming becoming available with this future land use map and some zoning changes? Do I think we what we would want to well, I have build out numbers for you, a couple <laughs> spreadsheet that, that goes into that in depth. Um, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head for residential build out with our current zoning. But that would definitely be something we would be looking at as we develop our multifamily zoning districts. And the idea, in my mind, from a planning perspective, would be we would want to somehow kind of balance out the net density so that we'd be taking maybe density shouldn't, maybe our residential density shouldn't be so high in highway commercial. That's not really a residential zone, right? But right now it's 18 units per acre. So we talked about the idea of like removing those 
the residential density and highway commercial and moving it out into a multifamily zoning district. So you would end up with maybe a net, the same net density or build out than our current zoning. This is so it's like a reallocation of yeah, reallocation. units from, yeah. especially taking out of highway commercial. Right. So yeah, I, well, I don't know anything about that process. What's that like? Is that Sorry, yeah, really, that really is. quick, Obi. Can you do you put your center for me again? That has a yeah. build out numbers. Yeah, that's the build out. Can everyone see that? Yeah. So I mean, it, 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 it's just a, so. I mean, maybe you just address my question. So BAE basically think I think said something around twelve thousand units under the current zoning but was the earlier question about if we change the future land use map so the, the current numbers were um that twelve thousand was total but then there was also considerations made for water capacity. i was going to say right and, and uh, constrained land infrastructure and damages which brought it down to 6300 or so okay yeah, we but that's pre, pre to your point, Obi and Steve. That's pre future land use plan. That's just what our current zoning is. So, by also kind of holding off right now on doing it for actual policy, we could maybe it would be wise to wait until we do some work on our future. But he's made Obi, Obi said, I never knew there was so many ways to make money until I had. Yeah, I was only going to say that. I guess the 12,000 is under our current zoning. If we decide we're going to do some stuff for water restrictions and who knows what the community might want to see in terms of development, uh, then that, I guess, changes can change lots of things. Yeah. And just to, th oh, go ahead, and just to throw it out there, I know that 12,000 figure is really alarming and we've got to, of course, plan for the maximum threshold, but 6,500 in highway commercial, like really is not realistic. Like this is not gonna happen. Like yeah. it doesn't pencil. I just looked today, I think it's uh, $750,000 a, and what is it? I mean, it's, right. I mean, it's so expensive. Right. It's, it's prohibitively expensive for deposit housing and highway commercial, right. especially for residents. Uh, it's expensive so. to put it anywhere in the line. Yeah. Yeah. Right. My question is, is oh. I'm so sorry. <laughs> We're going to keep this to, to the commission discussion. Um, um, just to sort of keep us on board. Um, yeah. Do we have a citizen's meeting? Yes, we do. It, just kind of keeping with the you know, standard rules. Um, but there is, so what, um, what would be helpful in terms of Fitting out of this meeting for next step. So we know we're going to come back into new year and increase public engagement. Right. right. We know that there the future land use plans maps got delayed. We want to come back to that effort. That's a huge opportunity in front of us, especially to your point, Steve, in terms of highway commercial really being unviable as that solution for density, multifamily residential, some of these definitions that are coming into the new land use code map could allow us more flexibility in terms of where that housing goes and in a way that is more economical than it is to assume 45 acres of highway commercial or whatever it was, it's gonna be, mm -hmm. right, so, you know, sufficient. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, just, I think this is more of an informational staff report at this point. And if you have any pressing, you know, ideas that you wanna share at this, this stage, uh, we welcome that, but, we're kind of at the point now where we have the data, we have the research, and we need to reach out now and see what this all means for like on the ground feasibility. So, I, I, uh, one thing I'd advocate for really strongly with the scenarios, and for you, Aaron, if this fits into what your scope of work already has, and if not, hopefully we could add it. Um, the um, I think studying the occupancy and ownership and doing a, a scenario there because um, I think it's worth noting the the um, the BAE um, memo that we're looking at that's in the packet isn't what was originally sent um, by BAE it just had occupancy and it was changed numerous times by recommendations by elected officials and appointed officials um, and so 
just noting that for the record that that was changed. So it's a little bit different than um, I guess what was originally submitted it. So I think it, we, we must look at that ownership versus occupancy because I see here we're looking again towards ownership and occupancy and it just may not pencil based on these percentages. Hold on to that well, because I want to come back to that as well outside of just this issue because I agree again I know that's come up several times both the ownership versus occupancy but also the definition of even occupancy alone in terms of like the way that it's written in the city which is what the county followed for occupancy covers people with school age children but not people with children who are in daycare. Yeah, that example, definition yeah. is in flux I would say at this point. And sure for occupancy though it's for not ownership even... too. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And so I think a scenario on what could yeah. local wealth actually do in terms of people being able to own these, because it's just, it's, as you all know, and this has, I think, been brought up before, but especially with the HDHO and the ownership requirements there, it's just, it's really, really confusing. And I think it's, you know, as a you know developer or builder looking in at this and wanting to to build it's it's really opaque and you know where with hdho the owner has to be a resident and the occupant whereas we've got a development viewgate terrace is 120 hdho units but it's an out-of-town developer and i've heard through the great so that's the whole thing i want to talk about actually okay. because let's let and multifamily maybe just be for very the record different, it's a different, very different scenario than single family homes so I'm going to just okay. kind of hit the pause sure. button really quick. So um, we are going to be talking about priorities that we want to bring forward next year. And I imagine that's going to be one on the list. And so let's come back to that, because I do think that that's something worth discussing and not just within the context of this, though. I think your point about scenario planning is a really good one. Yeah. And I know there was some confusion about multifamily applications of HDHO. Let's, let's have that in yeah. future considerations. Sure. I just want to keep this point of discussion to this particular issue. Yeah, but let's come back to that. I have one more clarifying thing just on your comment about the um, the memo from BAE and the occupancy ownership language being changed. It actually was in the scope of work in the RFP. It was included that we would want to look at ownership and occupancy. And I think that was just something that was kind of uh, literally it was kind of like a typo in the first memo that we were that BAE wasn't including the ownership language, which is what we intended from the outset of the study was to include looking at ownership as well as not. I know. I got my hat. There's a lot up. of us. There's no, I mean, there's just some, been some, I mean, if this is no, HGHO this doesn't is, need to come up as any accusation. We are super language, excited but. about learning the lessons from the HGHO, and I think there's a lot okay. to learn. Yeah. Okay, just to share, to from my perspective, it seemed like there's been a lot of feedback given and, you know, a willingness to listen to it, but then it's like, oh, and we're going, like, doubling down on right. what the feedback has been going against. We'll be so in. I just want to kind of like, we'll be, what's going We'll on? be bringing a new set of um, so at the beginning of last year, we brought our set of priorities that we discussed to the commission. That was largely adopted with the general plans on moving things sort of going flux. So we'll do the same thing next year. Where we will have that and, and and if and if I I don't know if this is relevant to this discussion, but it certainly is part of the BAE report. I know that when I was first on the planning commission, there was a concern that highway commercial would go residential general business would get too much residential in it in mixed use, et cetera. And if I understand the report, it's saying in many ways, we have a lot of business stuff, far more than we could actually take if it were zoned that way and still have any kind of housing uh, for folks. So that I guess is another implication of this and, and must have some ramifications for what we'll be doing. To piggyback off of that, what I thought was really interesting in this, it was like, if we build out 12,000 unit, units, we get 3,000 workers, right? And I'm like, how much commercial land do we need for 3,000 things? That's like, I saw that this beautiful study, all that, and I was like, oh, like, okay, 3,000, like, where do they go? How much do they need on that? That was one of the things I saw on that. And 
another thing <clears throat> that kind of watch go into the uh, I I put a few pipes down and on, on, on Steve's project <laughs> the other day in at the Sorry, uh, yeah. I don't take a level to some of them um, the the, uh, <laughs> uh, the housing fair you know I noticed you had stuff at two sixty two hundred sixty thousand starting right was that about right well you know <clears throat> if we look at affordability with the um, fifty four thousand a year uh, income threshold, you know, if you do a quick mortgage calculator of fifty thousand dollars down, you can afford two hundred and thirteen thousand dollars. So that's definitely is like amazing step in the right direction, but it's like definitely like kind of attainable. Maybe not super affordable, but yeah, it's a stretch. Um, the question, like I before when I first started, I was like, no, that owner occupancy, like. Yeah, no, it has to be locals. I would change, like, I definitely think now seeing it from that aspect, I'm like, yeah, having to make things work and, and buy in, it's like, yeah, I think that concession for me, I've changed my mind about like having outside owners on it. And I, uh, that's where I would stand on that. So, um Let's quickly play back on this issue and then there's some things we'll come back to when we talk about future priorities. Because mm -hmm. I think, you know, again, it's a conversation that goes beyond just the BAE study um, and really great points um, that I agree with. So, number one is an interest in doing a scenario planning exercise specific to applying this as written and making sure that um, the assumptions hold in a real world scenario. Also, potentially looking at if that occupancy standard were relaxed, to, excuse me, the ownership standard were relaxed to just the occupancy standard to meet the city, which is what the city says, what um, would that tell us? Um, what else What else do we kind of want to tag on to this in terms of next steps that we should be looking for? Oh, and reaching out to the community scheduling, probably, you know, if nothing else, a town hall, mm -hmm. um, and maybe even a public workshop right. on this once we have the data more available mm -hmm. for people to react to. Anything right. else that came up in the conversation for next steps we need to capture? I mean, I'd be curious to, you know, like what? I mean, it says here, I'm, I'm, I really like the, what I'm seeing on the agenda, you know, what are some possible next steps? I think uh, I'd really like to get pretty, granular on what is what does it look like to reach out to developers because mm -hmm. um, they were ultimately the ones that are going to build the housing so they right. are, they're about probably the highest priority are we are we going to have any like open house thing yeah, with that? I think that's, that's i think saying. i saw on that kind of right? a round table uh -huh. thing like we've had at the housing fair Right. I, I think that could oh, be awesome. No. Yeah. Get, yeah. You know, get builders, get developers. In there. Like focus group session. Yeah. 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 Let's um, let's start with that, and then if we find that that's not sufficient, we also can consider a committee focused on that issue as well, and just that way we can sort of divide and conquer. It could be useful to have that step happen before, and then we can kind of narrow down what the likely development scenarios might be based on developer input that that we could give to Aaron to, to go forth with a feasibility analysis based on that. Do we feel like type. we could target <clears throat> mid January, the second or third, well, third week of January for yeah. that? Yeah. Let's um let's see if we can find a date that works and circulate that. Um, our second meeting of December was canceled. So let's over, you know, with your office sort of meeting, let us know what dates might work. And, the other thing that I was just remembering as part of the discussion was to be revisiting the definition of actively employed households in relationship to occupancy and ownership. So, yeah, and that I think also extends beyond. I would love to, to separate some of these into smaller pieces. I would love to yeah. look at that independently and carry sort of, okay, there's two possibilities into our analysis, but I don't want to wait for something like this. To say if this is the right direction, let's let's go, because um, we know that that's been a constraint for things like uh, high density housing. So, 
Um, that's my reason for wanting to separate it is like, let's make that its own priority and work on things in tandem as opposed to grouping the giant globalist updates, which, right, you know, may or may not go the way that we intend if they're all matched together. Right, so. Sorry, just to clarify, do I the ownership and or occupancy at one time and then the workforce? My Sorry, recommendation the... is that while we are working <laughs> on increasing public um, engagement, Regarding the AEH, AEH code, right? Okay. So called the Workforce Housing Ordinance, yes. which is yeah. going to go back for a little bit of revision from, from BAE, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. Let's not pause on also revisiting our definition in the land use code for actively employed housing and also revisiting the occupancy versus ownership standard in the land use code regarding any of our workforce housing projects, not just anything that might come of this particular ordinance. That's my recommendation. I don't think that they need to be combined. No. Does anyone have a reason not to go that route? Okay. Fantastic. Any other questions for Elisa or Aaron? I think my only question for Aaron and maybe it's maybe it's he's already got it but i'm very concerned with about water yeah. and so when i see a buildup of twelve thousand, it it freaks me out no and we and did, so we did actually okay. do an adjustment for that okay great yeah really i know i saw that i saw that and is the, does that relate to the division of water rights what their capacity is as far as the amount of water rights that we have no, but I would can. love to get that. Okay. To, we, I don't think we've gotten that okay, great. far, but so, I, I definitely wanted to kind of recalibrate. The great. Number okay. That would just it. be my recommendation yeah. as we reach out to Mark Stilson and get yeah. that number. And, For sure. And, That's yeah. a good idea. I mean, I think it would be the great. And, and Trish, I'd, I'd, I'd piggyback on that. Uh, mm -hmm. Simply, it's so hard to know about water. Okay. Castle Valley is uh, yeah. down in a 20 year period, about 19% water. Not because of population growth, uh, but because of climate change. Yeah. And I believe it's the same thing on the other side, 19, 20% reduction in the water uh, uh, due to climate change. Who knows what a 25% reduction as you increase population and we don't know what climate change is going to do. So it's a, it's a very interesting and tough uh, yep. thing. Some people would say that the Gartner study, the one that's in in the hydrology journal, uh, is saying we're close to mining the aquifer right now. I don't know for sure, uh, but water may, may be an even bigger hindrance than we think it is, although we have a fair amount of resilience in, to, in that we use way more water than we should be using for a desert community. So many okay. variables moving. It, it might be one of those things like if we just want at, at one commission just to have Mark come and answer any questions that you know he, he's definitely come to the county commission a number of yeah, times. But we talked about having him come so, here and it got canceled. Okay, a couple times, so it's, I'm so, just yeah. throwing that out because uh, yeah. he's such a wealth of knowledge right. and it's all very in my mind unbiased, just mm -hmm. database numbers what yeah. we've got, you know, so yeah. anyways, I'm just throwing that'd be great. I know it's just one more thing. We could give him the build out study and then have him kind of- That'd be awesome. Look at that and then give us his perspective. Yeah. And then present it. Okay. I think that'd be great. That'd be there. awesome if you like, really, yeah. I, I would, if he hasn't seen this, I'd actually love to, yeah. Just even kind of a pre-mortem. Yeah. Yeah, so the, if you, if you want me to, but it, it probably makes more sense for you to reach out to him, but okay. whatever you need me to do is fine. I have one other note here. Um, how are we incorporating Northern Sandwich County into any of this? I know that's not in their scope of work, but maybe if they have something else that we can dovetail in, um, yeah. I don't know what we could do to, there's a lot of, I mean, from the water side and yep. from oh, water. possible yeah. and possible build out though, whatever yeah. they have coming on board. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, they have a lot. It's all the same. They have a lot. Too. Right, right, right. <laughs> that would that's a really good question. I yeah. Don't think we yeah, we this definitely doesn't incorporate that side of Spanish Valley. So um Aaron, do you guys do a two for one special? Yeah. <laughs> they, they, um, 
they have a lot going on. And, and again, I, I just spoke to one of their planning commissioners the other day, and she had no idea about water rights and how much San Juan County doesn't have a lot of water. Um, so I'm not sure where, yeah, they yeah. think they're going to get their water, but that we're dipping into the same aquifer. So, and people do over allocate water. It happened in Cedar City. And, and so I think we need to be very concerned about what San Juan County is doing and their build out because it does directly affect us. Yeah. <laughs> that is correct. That is correct. Yep. Okay. Well, Aaron, thank you so much for joining us today. And um, why don't we have this on our agenda at the start of the year to make sure that we revisit it and review those next steps and um, I'm both in there. But I do think that public town hall would be. Right. Anything else on this issue? I, I, I had a question about this too. It was like we had all those other documents and then like those kind of got old and one was there, that because of the just draft versions at this point. Right. Is that the uh is that because there's stuff in flux with the state and the city? So is that like... um really it's just because we don't want to put forth something that's not we don't really have a Right. a solid draft at this point. Right. It's okay. in flux. And, that, and that's what we want to get the feedback. It, once we get to the point of having our public workshops, we will definitely be providing the information that needs to be known in order to make informed, you know, right. need to provide feedback. But I think it just, at this point, we're just, we're not, it's not, it's just a draft. So it's not really like something that you feel proud of at this point. Yeah, yeah, Possibly, yeah. You know, I mean, and I'm assuming they're getting that thirty some percent because they're like, okay, you get 12,000 12, total, and then you get three thousand workers out of it. So that's well, 30, we don't have 30. a percent yet. Um, we're, that's kind of. Something I, I thought I, I read right. that in there. It was it something around thirty some percent? The city has the city's percentage that they adopted in their ordinance was thirty three percent. Okay, and, but they're ordinance is only targeted at their R3 and R4 zoning. So it's multifamily. It's very different than what we would be looking at. For <coughs> uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. And so that percentage question is the question we will be wanting to answer through public engagement. Because yeah. the data suggests something, but it might not be the feasible thing. You know what I mean? So it might have to be adjusted and to work. For, for a project to cancel out. Okay. So that would be like the crux of what we would be finding out through engagement with developers. And, yeah. Is there other is there other places in Utah that's doing this like restriction on deed restriction? There are um, other places in Utah that have adopted similar policies that have even gone further where they adopted um, requiring mandatory affordable housing, which you know, common in a lot of different states. Um, I just want to go, yeah. I, is there some examples I can go look at? Or, or? I don't think, well, just no app city that I know. Oh, okay. So but like Park, this Park City? Park, they have, city. The Park City does okay. have the affordable housing okay. um, ordinance, yeah. And I can't remember, there's, there's probably a few other examples. I'm going to go back. But Park City is the one that stands out in Summit County in general. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Challenges are fairly distinct. You know, yeah. the city has the city right there right. next to them. Beaver, uh, Midway, Springdale might be interesting to look at. Yeah. I was looking at some Washington County stuff, but I don't know if I've seen anything out of Springdale. Awesome. Yeah. Um, also, now would be a great time to engage Green River. That mm -hmm. article that came out about their challenges, I think, you yes. know, again, the more partners yeah. we can have, and also, um, there are things I'm sure that we've learned that they could benefit from. Mm -hmm. So that'd be a really great opportunity. Yep. Final thoughts, planning commissioners. Um, so our commission packet, this is the future considerations, which is normally at the end, but we'll go ahead and chat through that. Um yeah. I think I put it in there. It's but anyway, it's just a little bit of a discussion. Right, yeah. Um, 
So what we've done in the past is talked about the um, priorities that this body would like to move forward. And you know, it's the recommending body to the commission. And we want to make sure that the commission is not out of lockstep with its priorities, but we also hear from the community and from factions of the community on these specific issues regularly and um, have a distinct voice to bring. So I was just looking through our priorities list. We, I guess we didn't have one for 2022, or if we did, I can't find it in my drive. Um, but even going back to 2021, you see a lot of the same thing that we've been talking about and things that we've made um, progress on. Our Southern 191 corridor is being, that's something we prioritized as a plan we think is a high priority. That's being <laughs> captured by the future land use planning. Um, Article three updates related to APUs will go before the commission at their next meeting, maybe? I haven't seen that yet, have we? Uh, the Article three revision? No, it's kind of been limbo in legal review, but it just hasn't gotten a good vote. Yeah. What is the first thing you said on your list? I'm sorry. Southern 191 corridor. Okay. Yeah. And that was the, we had the survey on Spanish That's Valley. Right. Um, and so the future land use planning really includes that entire corridor. Great. Thank you. Um, Tiny home communities. So we are going to be tracking <coughs> the alternative dwelling overlay, which enables that type of development. There's been some people who have expressed some interest, so we'll be tracking that interest. Um, use clustering and use specific standards. Land use code cleanup is one that's sort of out there. Um, water conservation in the land use code was a top priority. Um, let's see, pedestrian transport. So we have our transportation master plan now, as well as bypass study transportation plan update was suggested by the commission at the time. Um, more opportunities for citizen input, which I realize, you know, there's always room to grow there. And this last year we've had town halls, we've had several public workshops. I think, you know, we can take that momentum to continue to expand that. Um, so again, these were things back in, in 2021 that we listed as priorities. And, you know, many of these are things we've made meaningful progress on. I would love, actually, if you all are open, Elisa and I gave a presentation at the um, housing fair and took some of the comments, including things like the definition of workforce housing and the occupancy versus ownership question, um, and laid it out as sort of like, this is what we have done, this is what we're tracking, and this is what we think we could do. I know you saw this presentation. Um, I'd love if we just kind of take you through those slides quickly and then start a just brainstorm just get a list of you know what are the priorities that we think need to be top of mind. Ask staff to propose a rough timeline of that. How, here's how the staff thinks they might be able to support these priorities, and then we can take that roadmap to the county commission uh, to make sure that there's no you know fundamental disagreement. Yeah, cool. Do you want to share your screen and we walk through those four slides? Or Jenna, those slides. So go back to Zoom. <coughs> oh, you know that didn't work. Okay. That's why. All right. Are you on the Zoom on your one? No. Okay. I can just turn it off. Okay. Okay. Lean in and we will we plan to share this in Green County Connects anyway. Um so uh essentially we broke this down into Oh, and of course our folks online can't see that. Yeah, I'm getting on there right now. Oh, when is the next housing fair? Is that just series? Yeah, um, I don't know the date. January. Uh, it's 
scheduled for the 11th, but I think it'll be pushed back at least a week, if not two. We'll meet it tomorrow. Um, but that'll be very publicized. I forget what yeah, yeah. We, that, we, what's the theme of this one? This is um, more family oriented. It's going to be held at the middle school um, and a lot about tenant landlord relationships and what to do if you're looking for housing or if you have housing but still need help, that sort of thing. Um, and then the last session will be in March about mm -hmm. ADUs. Okay. So, yeah. so yeah, we'll have um, the article three updates by then, hopefully. Okay, that's great. Article three updates. Yeah. I have a question. It's a little maybe off topic, but um, it is really of Steve Evers. So, you know, we've talked a lot about building tiny, <laughs> tiny homes and the problems with building tiny homes. And now we have the opportunity to build tiny homes. But if I understand correctly, Steve is in the process of building tiny homes. And my question really is, I don't want a long answer, but were there any problems with a developer putting tiny homes on an HDHO property or was that just easy to do? I don't think they're technically tiny homes. They're it's, so efficiency units. Um, nope, everything's to code. So. When, I, when you say that, give me the range in size. I know there's at least two sizes. Yeah, so the single bedrooms are like 450 to 550 square feet. And then the two bedrooms are like 550 to 625. And, and, what, and what, what would people usually call tiny homes? Are they more like 300 feet? I actually for, I forget. Um, yeah. there's, there's no standard definition. It's 400-ish or so. We, our like unit that. up there yeah. is more like 320 square feet well what my wife and i live yeah. in so we're looking at these new ones coming on board thinking oh, oh my oh, god yeah. i have to size <laughs> up or just get larger 450 square feet <laughs> i mean ob i have uh, well i have i oh, think what you what steve has um i have a shipping container and i think it's yep. three the only issue was the r value in the walls but it, it, it yeah. got, it passed code. I know that that was the only kind of issue going in. And well, so and, just I, I won't, I won't go too right. well. And I won't go too far on this, but I mean, it's the way to potentially get quote affordable housing there. It's really two things. Everybody talks about property value. You know, that's really hard to build a house uh, because of property being so expensive. But the second thing is, you know, somebody goes and builds a 2,000 square foot or 2,500 square foot or 3,000 square foot house and then says, gee, nobody can afford it. So I really commend these efficiencies or tiny houses or uh, shipping uh, container uh, units as a way to have uh, really actually low income housing that people can afford. And the key to it all is density, uh, right? Like, and why they're yep. why those units are the size that they are, in part because we think it's smart building design, and uh, but the the lot and the the layout of the of the land, you know, we're constrained by you know having this really steep hillside and these terraces, and so you know that's kind of maximizing the actual building footprint, and then you know parking parking is is really difficult to to get around, and so. You know, you have to have space for that, and so yeah, it's getting creative with with the with the land that you do have and increasing the density where you can as much as you can. Thank you. So, um, these so th these are sort of the four types of housing that we see supported by um, the land use planning efforts that we are looking at right now in graduations of density. So those smaller units, um, all ADUs, uh, or excuse me, alternative dwellings. Manufacturing homes could fit in a number of these categories, so they're a little bit of an outlier. Um, then ADUs, um, low to mid density, and then finally higher density, traditional multi multifamily. Um, 
Lisa has been collecting some really interesting diagrams showing that there's a difference between sort of the footprints and aesthetic, aesthetic side of housing and even the density within an individual unit. So like these pictures at the bottom here were uh, it's an architect's rendering, but you can actually see, you know, the footprint itself isn't so much the issue is how many units a, a piece of land can support. You don't need in some cases, in most cases. So, um, like I said, what I'd love to go through here is just quickly run through. This is our synopsis of what we've been hearing from you all, um, from public input, from some of the research that planning and zoning has been doing generally. And um, have an open conversation about which of these really stand out as like a why aren't we just doing this now type thing or this is something we really want to look into now or we think the county needs us to be focused on versus things that are you know great idea let's keep it in the back pocket and also calling out things that aren't on here and maybe jenna you could um we can list these if you want to just keep running notes and then i'd love to just get a rough sort of estimate of prioritization from the group before we break does that sound good and then we'll ask planning and zoning to give us that that viability of timeline, amount of work, and roadmap. Cool. All right. Um, okay. So um, ADO passed. So we'll be watching that, and that includes this component of tiny home usage. So there is this question of, um, I've heard a couple commissioners have asked me, do we need a land use code updates specifically targeting tiny homes? It seems to me like waiting and watching might be the right approach. Um, but then there's this um, four acre minimum requirement for manufactured home communities, which is not just about denser communities, but the if you have an acre of land and you want to put two manufactured homes on it, you can't kind of question. And probably that's the one that's sticking your nugget than it seems because then there's questions of well, how dense do you go? So can I ask a quick question. Yeah. How what is the response been on the ADL? Uh, people applying for it. Um, to current intent to apply, and I know of three others that are working. So about five kind of coming down. Uh, how so many? About, they get so about forty units 40 received. Minutes. Um, I could speculate on what the couple might be. Um. You know, conversation. Anything that I can go through the whole list and we can back up, or just you know, go ahead and fire off if there's anything in here that starts a thought. I think it seems like a priority that on the to do there, and then the four acre minimum. Mm -hmm. That to me seems high priority. Okay. So four acre minimum requirement. Keep us going and we'll back now. Um, so we're waiting for the ADU. Right. The ADU changes um, that will be coming in January, February um, to the County Commission as a public hearing will effectively uh, increase the minimum square footage for an ADU. I mean, sorry, the maximum square footage of an ADU um, to be 1,200 square feet measured from the exterior. And versus a thousand square feet. So it's a little increase, but I've heard from some builders that that actually can create quite a difference um, in being able to have like a two bedroom ADU versus just a one bedroom. Um, and then we do have a few other little changes um, to allow for reduced setbacks for ADUs. I think, I think it's an all zone, but it's not really the actual. Yeah. And so hopefully that'll help a little bit to um, you know encourage more AD construction. But most of what we're hearing with the impediments to that is more construction material labor costs. Yeah. Being the appropriate factor, not necessarily our code. So it seemed like financing was like a big yeah. mention to on that. There was a um, gosh, I was reading a press release just yesterday. Um, the Biden administration is doing a lot to increase liquidity of loans for smaller homes, ADUs specifically, targeting people. Um, one of the things that stood out was if you own an existing home and you want to build an ADU, they, um, through Freddie Mac, I don't know how far this goes, but they want to make it so if you 
are going to be using that ADU for long-term rentals, that that could be sufficient to cover the burden of proof for getting your loan. Okay. And as opposed really to other income streams. Yeah. Amazing. So there's a lot yeah. of work happening out of there. Right, mm -hmm. right. That's yeah. Right now. That's great. That's really, yeah. I don't think we did great That's work really on, on this, in particular with, we have some advisory group Right, it's been so long. We were meeting with them. Right. We yeah. met in here. Toby yeah. was in on it, and Josie Kovash. Mm -hmm. I, I don't. Know. I think where it stands, like the the groundwork is there. It's just financing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, financing. Yeah, it's it's a high priority in my mind. But you know, it's kind of like my hands are sort of tied. By. One of the other things that the BAE uh, scope of work set out to do in a phase two study was um, to look at economic development's possible program for funding or helping to fund support ADU construction. So through grants that they get, that they would put out some grant program like to help with maybe the impact fees or I don't know how far it could go, but that would be something that the study would potentially look at. Yeah, I mean, the STAR grant got doubled. Mm -hmm. And that was already used to build workforce housing or to, to fund workforce housing construction. So some of the things that have come up. Um, so this is this has hit the city because the city already adopted their APU ordinance and they required and then our code reflects this um, owner occupancy for ADUs. So if you own a duplex and you put a ADU in the backyard, you have to live in one of the duplexes. And there were already some people who had a conforming ADU on property of their duplexes they were renting out that found themselves in positions of not being able to um, construct the ADU or being in non-compliance. So I think that's when you know we should talk to the city and, and get their learnings and um because they're already ahead of us on this one anyway. But I'd I'd love to um revisit why we're doing that. Yes, <laughs> what is it really beneficial or necessary to require? The owner of the land to live in one of the units, mm -hmm. whether it's the primary or accessory dwelling. Yeah. Main question is like, what when you sell it? If you sold the place now, like the buyer's like, oh, I can't buy this. I have to live here. You know, like, yeah. I, you know, I don't know. Um, but to me, would be yeah. yeah. Um, I did back on the ADO thing. I did have a friend. I was like, dude, you should do the ADO. Like, you have a half acre through that. Like he was looking for places to buy. I was like, that's a fast, fast return on investment. You drop five grand and get that back in a year. And he was like, well, it wasn't a guarantee. Like his only feedback on that I was thought was interesting was like, well, it's not a guaranteed thing. I might go do that. And then it's not like it might not pass. So I just thought that was a, was like the application fee itself is what seven hundred fifty dollars. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that was the only thing that I I yeah. heard because I would like to be like, oh, you got a half acre, throw a little thing in the back. That's what. But he he was looking to purchase land. Yeah, and he was like, that. well, I don't know, maybe you know something else. I think that makes sense given that it's a pilot program. Yeah. Yeah. I think you know if we continue that in the future, <laughs> then maybe that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, Commissioner Clapper was. Um, during the workshop ahead of this, um, going back to the county commission, was the one who suggested, well, could we have a way for people to signal interest yeah. before they commit, which is something yeah. that you know has stood in the way of other overlay projects. And so now we have that ability to the intent to apply a process to yeah. kind of get uh, halfway, okay. you know, to, to the point that you know you can find out if you're just fully non-viable right. before okay. you have to invest more money. Exactly. So okay. that was a step in that direction, but, but no, it's it's a good call out. Yeah. Um, so cost barriers are already raised. That could be financing or materials. Um, we're also, I'm really curious, and I know a couple of people I've talked to have expressed this, um, just tracking new versus con existing construction. You know, because if you've got everyone on site and you are offsetting the cost of a new home by putting an ADU in at the time versus building it after the fact, I'd love to know, like, numbers-wise what we're seeing, but also I'd love to learn qualitatively what could be behind some of what we might find. So not that that is top priority, but something we should track. Yeah, for sure. Hopefully data is perfect. And then some of the ideas. So um, 
land land trust like deeding. So this was the idea, and the community land trust has already said that they're not in a position to handle this capacity. So this would be off the table for this year. But this is the idea of okay, you have an acre of land, you built your home, you know, half of an acre is just you know uh, sagebrush weeds. <laughs> um, you don't maybe have the money to build an AQ, but could you deed that remaining half acre to a group like the community land trust who would manage it similar to Royal Crossing, where they would, for all intents and purposes, have you know, the ability to manage that land, build an ADU on it, and rent it out to the local workforce, and you could get an initial fee, you know, or initial payment in lieu, or some equity. So it's a you know ambitious idea that would obviously need to be talked through, but if the community land trust were able to handle that type of capacity, it could help us get past some of those cost barriers in ways the private market might not be able to at scale. Um, HUD certified support. This is not so much us. This is more of a policy question, but I've raised this before. The fact that increasingly we're seeing, especially the manufactured housing industry, innovate very quickly, building very nice models. Um, and for speed and efficiency, they're getting them certified through HUD standards. And so we have this now patchwork. Some communities across the country allow HUD occupancy, which is essentially bypassing what is otherwise, you know, it has to be like stick frame type construction to yeah. permit all the process that. Anyway. Okay, so owner occupancy is one that stands out of uh, revisiting and you know, talking to the city. Last meeting of the year. We're doing I mean, I think, <laughs> I think really kind of coming up with like a Getting our heads wrapped around like what what could we actually implement for helping out landowners to fund AD construction? Because we've talked about a few different things. There's federal resources maybe coming online. There's economic development grants. Um, there's yeah maybe we just like maybe just we would have that as something we could highlight at a house. Think fair and kind of get the round table discussion going again once we do some more research. But just that funding aspect, I think, is I think that's where we're at with ADUs right now is not necessarily any more than just the most prohibitive factor is financing the construction of an ADU. This is one where I would really love to see a code almanac on Grand County Connects because it, it's so intimidating for people who are just getting started to even sort of like know where to look. Um, and it would be wonderful if when I landed on that page, I saw, are you trying to build this type of construction? And then in like layman's English, this is what that process is gonna look like. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, that could be a side project. That's not my intention. That'd be planning and zoning, but that's not my idea. So um, low to mid density. So we know we have a Royal Crossing um, continuing their journey. We are going through the future land use planning maps. Um, it would be helpful to understand from staff, maybe not tonight, but when you're compiling this, um, just kind of what we think that's gonna look like in terms of your time, because your time is really what dictates what this body is able to get accomplished. Right. Um, I mean, the general plan, just so great to get that done, but really took up two thirds of last year. And it's not really done. And it's not really done. <laughs> so. There's all these gaps, mm -hmm. which is one of them is the land use element. That's a big one. I think that would be our high priority since we started it and got some good momentum going with it. It it holds so many possibilities for housing. Well, I mean, a lot of different solutions wrapped up into one effort. So, in our in my mind, I would love to get back to it as soon as we can. Um, get through maybe the noise mitigation ordinance stuff, get through that, and then maybe be working on picking up the future land use planning again while we're simultaneously um, getting some feedback on the workforce housing ordinance. What do y'all think? Yeah. I think I can just reverse those priorities for just how I see things. So. 
Yeah, it sounds like we want to do the uh, noise thing in January. Come up with something to pass in February then. And you're saying to flip it? Finish the land use stuff? Yeah, I see. I, think the, I, I see. The I was throwing that out there. I don't yeah. know yeah. It's strong. I just see that the noise mitigation thing is an ordinance that could probably be a shorter and a more attainable thing to implement sooner than the future land use planning. I think it's going to be much more of a a longer process, right? And so I'm just I don't know if we want to. It's totally well, that, up to you guys. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah, I see the validity in that. Yeah. Especially, I think that the noise ordinance have more people on edge right. sort of, to have you know on both a process and resolution it's yeah. better for the community. Yeah. Track and approve. So this is where those two come in. This is why I wanted to pause and come back to it. So occupancy versus ownership, and definition of workforce. So they're in our land use code today. So these would be re revisiting what already exists, um, given what we know today, and then also community engagement, and particularly with community of people who are finding this is getting in the way of building housing for, for locals. Yeah. Uh, mixed use is sort of land use planning. So that's also what <coughs> else, you know, it goes, up and goes within the future land use plan for sure. And then policy incentives was the idea of, um, you know, can you fast track applications that meet certain qualifiers like, you know, above a certain percentage deed restricted for locals, or um, is there the ability to reduce fees? There's obviously some degree to which we can't affect special boards and so on, but with regards to the county and understanding this is where you know having that conversation we talked about like understanding where those those constraints in the system are um and getting past the assumptive phase phase or the just sort of like public discord phase and actually get to oh 40 percent of projects that hit this phase don't go through this is a real problem we need to practice so i i don't know if we have any data even to start to expose that but um it's, it continues to come up and yet the specifics aren't there. So let's get to the specifics in a way that's kind of universally understood. Okay, right, I'll scroll through these last ones and then we'll just go back through. Um, so, continue to track HCHO, future land use plan, multifamily residential, occupancy workforce again, um, workforce housing requirements, density bonuses. So that's, I guess, the only one that's net new in here. Um, density bonuses and also things like um, maybe this falls under policy, but height restrictions, parking, right? Like, okay, if you're within X miles of the city center or some node, should your parking requirements be the same as if you are way out in, you know, my neck of the woods? And how does that change as we things like the pilot for mass transit? Obviously, that's mass transit is giving it a lot of. We're putting a lot into that word, but we're seeing it. We're seeing buses, y'all. They're so urban. Wait, are they? Are they? Are they? The city's piloting it. Yeah. Move. Take a ride. And it's like a quasi or uh, Uber public transit kind of scenario. It's really interesting. Noel can fill you in. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, okay. Okay. If you want to go into it right now, but before let's we'll come back to it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, I'll just call out the city's assuming that we're gonna, you know, the county is gonna house 40% of their units. So we're already saying people who can't afford to live in the city are gonna have to live further from their jobs. You know, how do we make it cheaper and easier for them to get to work? And how do we make it cheaper and easier to build housing for those people so that they can live? No, we've provided a bunch of funding for that. We're supposed to be a part of that mass transit. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. awesome. Okay. I mean, in terms of like parking requirements, okay, you right, know, right. as we build multifamily right. residential, do we expect to have the same parking requirements as we would for a similarly number of people across a less dense area? You know, that's come up a lot over the last several years. I that's a I personally love to get into that. Okay. Um, some of the things that I've heard tonight, uh, more town halls and public engagement, direct engagement with the building community, 
um, water wise policies OB in terms of land use you raised that um, just water conservation and I know you've raised several times it's not just conservation but it's ensuring we're not hardening our water sources just because we reduce you know that doesn't always mean um, and clear. Jenna, do you have a list or I can read you my list, but I don't know priorities. Yeah. Would you have gone through? Yeah. What I have is finishing the land use code element of the general plan, being a long process, the wells mitigation, um, occupancy versus ownership and the definition of workforce, community engagement, and working out calls, as you just mentioned, and the water wise quality policies. So why don't we just go round robin if anyone has anything else to add to that list? Otherwise, um, you know, why don't we all just say sort of our top three priorities and then um, Planning and zoning staff can come back to us and say, you know, this is what we see as the viable plan. I assume some of this also is going to be public engagement, discovery, and so on. So it doesn't mean just because we want to do it, we do it next. But I'd love to hear from your office what you think is feasible. Um, and then we'll take that to the commission and learn if there are things that they want to have on our um, radar that might not be the priorities of the people represented on the body. We make sure that that's included in the conversation and then we can start our year kind of hit and go. Cool. All right. Steve, do you want to kick off? I think it's just this slide basically. So okay. <laughs> priorities would be for me, owner occupancy, specifically as that relates to fence user HDHO, workforce housing definition, and then um, I mean, density bonuses for higher density. But that is how we're going to solve. Have to have higher density in the most appropriate places. Could I? Could I? Uh, I want to interrupt. Just to, could could Jenna sh, uh, put that list on the screen? Oh yes. It, it might just be helpful for me at least. Um, here, we'll put it into the chat. Mind re finishing the land use code element of the general plan. And um, I type on your computer. Do you want to type? <laughs> there we go. Okay. Oh, you. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so Obi, we'll we'll type it into the chat, and that way we've got it. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Would like me to chat if you continue to take care of it? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let's um. While Jenna's typing that in, so Rick, was there anything in that um conversation that you think you would want to have that wasn't mentioned already as a priority? No, mm -hmm. I think that you know, the workforce housing kind of addresses the, the affordable housing thing. So, you know, I think that I back to this noise mitigation okay. thing also. You're right, there are a lot of people concerned about that. So, I don't know what else you've got on your list that we could actually check a box, a block, because a lot of these are really lengthy. If there's some that are near the same priority that aren't near as likely, can we check them again? So, um, I mean, certainly community engagement is something we can be doing if we are waiting on staff to be working on other longer term things. But I'm just going to so workforce housing, noise mitigation, and then like low hanging fruit. Is that correct? Did I capture that correctly? Yeah. Um, I think we. Uh, the feeling I get, and, and it's funny, the noise thing kind of kind of made me more aware of it, is that when we do, <clears throat> you know, the people that are going to, there's a couple of groups that are going to help us with the housing issue. And the big one, you know, is the, uh, you know, we've got a good pulse on like, you know, Southeast Utah Housing Authority, they got their thing on. And another big thing, because, you know, is the private subdivision people and it's like man i 
I really feel like we need to hundred percent before we pass anything. Like, what do you like? Is this even feasible to do guys? Is this like, you know, going to work out pencil out. So we avoid any conflicts and like, you know, like those programs like the HDHO, like, Hey, you know, what, what helped, what didn't it on that? That to me is like so important. And then, you know, I've been beating this drum and I've been kind of thinking about how to make this one, you know, we're talking about water. Is there anything we could do to like, Hey, you're more water wise. You can like, you know, like, I mean, I'll show you ways that we can use building code to reduce 25% of our water like that. Like as a plumber, we've, we've done it. I've done houses that reduce water. Um, you know, I'm just, I'll throw that out there. Like, like, a, like an incentive. Like a hybrid. Yeah, but just I've just been trying to think of levers how to do that because yeah. we kind of have to work with these building codes, but we're in the land use. Like, where do you get that? Anyways, I just throw that out there. But um, I think you know that that idea of like you know I talked with Emily this like having a counter on the top of our webpage like this is how much water for the things we have with our current usage like like so we can know where we stand, I, yeah, that was a fantasy, but um, <laughs> uh, yeah, that to me is, that to me is uh, important. And uh, yeah, that's where I, that, yeah. So direct engagement. Yeah. Water incentives. Yeah. And data, whatever. Right, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll let you fill in the blank however you want to do. Um, uh, Maketa or OB with that list now in the chat, are you prepared to weigh in or do you want another moment? I think I'm okay. I think I would be interested in density bonuses, community engagement, and I don't know, um, water policy, all are, I think, important uh, to work on. Many other things also. Yes. Maketa? Oh, you're muted. Oops, sorry, thank you. Um, I guess I'm gonna go with um, community engagement, particularly um, parts of the community that isn't normally engaged. Um, and then the finishing the land use code element of the general plan, I think is something I think will be helpful for us. I'm really hope these things are great. Yeah, um, it's, it's hard to choose. Um, I'd say my own are um, community engagement, uh, sort of just understanding the water situation in general, whether that's allowing for incentives or um, just even an understanding, because it just comes up every single time. And I'd like to either know, yes, this is a red alarm too, or hey, actually, here's what we have to work with. Um, and then I think the occupancy versus ownership is something that I particularly committed to the training for. I, I also, I just want to say after hearing McKay say that, uh, you know, several times I hear the word stakeholder and I just want to make sure we always know that stakeholders are both, you know, the housing development people, et cetera, et cetera, who actually know how to build houses and the people that would try to buy them or rent them or try to get a down payment, those voices are important also in terms of, quote, things penciling out. It's got to pencil out on both sides somehow. That was a big takeaway from the housing fair. Um, and also just making sure, not just when we're talking about what to build or how to build, but also where we are saying, maybe not here, talking about the impact of where we don't build or don't build to a certain density the effect that has on the people in our workforce and in our community as well. And their voices should be at the table as well. Um, okay, well, okay. thank you for going through. Yes, Rick. So I keep harping on this, but I'd still like to see that map eventually of all the projects that are in the pipeline. Yeah. You know, that you know, we never see their own, you know, I keep driving through the valley, all of a sudden there's a subdivision here, subdivision there, comes back to the water, comes back to everything else. So yeah. what's What's already out there? Yeah, and we're talking about new stuff coming in, but what are we already? What are we already What's looking at that we can't see? Mm -hmm. And I do think it's There's important to lot. understand San Juan County too. Yeah, that would be really good. I mean, I think the only we do have a great map 
um, of the HGHO projects that are either going in now or will be very soon. There aren't a whole lot of other subdivisions that we have. It, obviously, there, it's been interesting. <clears throat> we don't have a lot of um, current applications. But maybe that's maybe we're looking more at the city and understanding what the city's doing the city's, too, right? The city's got plenty. There's also. a lot going on. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. It's, yeah, yeah that's tough. like an old, like a complete valley picture yeah. of build out current and future. Right. And, and how does that apply in all these overlays and, and everything right. else? So we've got, you know, you're, are you overlaying something that's already planned that we can't see on a map? Right. Yeah. So that's where we that. need a university researcher. Yeah. And I've said that before, I've reached out to USU before, and it's not gone very far. Uh, and then the question, you know, okay, so you've got an approved subdivision. How long does that last? I know that's come up. Is that a 10 year window, a three year window? Before they build it? Yeah. It's two years. Okay. It seemed like it was longer than before, though. So, yeah. And I might add this. Future land use plan will really keep us all busy. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, that's so, it's, it's, it's been emphasized so important and needs so much public input uh, and our own time. All right, um, well, thank you everyone. So um, staff is going to come back to us with sort of a, I'm hoping for um, rough a, a rough timeline, sort of realistic expectations. Um, you know, I think it would be wonderful to publicize that, get that out in the open as early as possible, even before we went to the commission so that, um, if there were other you know comments of things people have ideas around at least that's captured we'll um review that at our first meeting in january and then plan on taking that to the commission i think be great um so thank you all right uh so we uh hit our six o'clock citizens to be heard so we'll do a quick round of citizens to be heard and then we'll um wrap up so if you're here to make a comment during citizens to be heard uh you have three minutes to make a comment i see one hand raised online if you could state your name at the beginning for the notes, that'd be great. Brittany, were you here to make a comment? Oh, you know what? Sure, I'll make a comment. Um, this is Brittany uh, Melton. Anyway, I just wanted to tell you guys I appreciate what you guys do. Um, and one of the things that I think um, maybe Aaron, I don't know all of you guys' names yet, but um, just said is reaching out to different people and finding more about different um, groups. Um, and that goes a long way. So I really, really appreciated that comment. And I agree with that um, from all different aspects. So um, if I could re, um, reiterate that, I would highly suggest it just because um, one of the things that I kind of go back to, I know that um, Steve gets. Um, talked about water and how he had a pipe dream and that really got me thinking and so I'm really kind of waiting um, to get involved in in what he had more to say on that and maybe you guys can too because you had mentioned that Emily about the water um, maybe he has a lot to say on that I don't know but um, these people are pretty dang smart in our community and we just need to need to utilize them anyway that's all my comments thanks thank you Brittany if you guys want to make a comment, you've been sitting here the whole time. I thank you so much. <laughs> There's a lot to comment on. Yes. You know what? I'll go ahead. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity uh, to engage and, and collaborate on the noise land use issue. Um, you know, that's exactly what we were frustrated with. And so um, I'm happy. I'm happy for that opportunity. And, and I hope that uh, more than anything, we can actually come up with something viable uh, that the whole community can support, um, which is another pipe dream. But um, <laughs> listening to this last discussion, uh, a couple of things I'd, I'd throw out there is uh, on, our, on our subdivision applications, um, is there any sort of project counter where I submit an application six months later uh, made no headway. 
and we reach back out and, and figure out what the what the roadblocks are that that have held these up. You know, I know of, I know of several that have been in the works for a really long time, and and some that even aren't financially uh, viable because they're being held to the same standards that a larger subdivision would be held to. And so, you know, in a perfect world, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna hold all our subdivisions to the same you know, rubric. But uh, our our need is so dire that maybe we can put in a cap. And, yeah, you're doing you know two or three lots on a two acre parcel. Yeah, you don't need curb and gutter in the middle of you know where the next curb and gutter is four miles away from you. You know, let's maybe you know explore some of those things to. To just streamline the process. So, I don't know. Just an idea. Is that? I talked to somebody who was trying to subdivide one acre into three, with wanting to deed restrict two of those acres to locals, and they had to put in like a three hundred thousand dollar road. But is that? That's not land use code. It's roads, roads, and building. That's their mean? policy. Yeah. And I don't know if we could have any influence on it. But it's the idea that development pays for itself in terms of infrastructure and it taxes. Shouldn't be paying for that's something that doesn't. And I do, I, I, I've talked to roads quite a long time ago. We've talked about this, you know, the idea that it seems like a lot to require a small property owner, not a developer, to put in a road and curb and gutter when it's not connected to anything like that for miles and miles. Um, Fortunate, it's a tough one. But let's make sure that um, roads and building are both at the table. Because I think when we talk about costs, you know, a lot of times it's invisible costs. Well, yeah, there's, there's community costs at the moment. Yeah. Preserve right. rural character. Nick, do you mind saying your full name for the. Uh, Nick Oldham. Thank you. All right. Any other comments? Yeah, just yeah. Mark Moore. Um, read the studies and it's like 2022 and we're going back to studies in 2018 and we all know there's been a workforce housing shortage forever. I mean, I own a business and I won't buy a house or build a house right now because I refuse. I know what it cost I did it for 23 years in my prior life. I know what it costs to build a house, what it takes and how long it is. And prices of Grand County most absolutely ridiculous thing I've ever seen in my entire life. But I'm going to say it's 52,000 million of income. Okay, that's fine. 792,000. Right? I mean, these people at 52,000 couldn't afford a house four years ago. So we do need community housing. We do need county and city and state housing. That's the only way you're going to be able to put anybody here. But then you do all these studies really quick because I have three minutes that. Okay, you want to put 12,000 houses, you want to worry about the water where it's coming from, but you know, study says, studies are great. I've worked in Las Vegas for 23 years, built a lot of homes and a lot of buildings and hospitals and everything else. But how we're drafting 30, was it 2,800 jobs off this housing? Where are the jobs and what coming from? There is nowhere else. We're building these homes and you want people to buy them and it's going to give 2,800 more jobs, but that's not true because there's no one there's no one anywhere to house anybody to build it. The one other, and Moab's different. Moab doesn't have there's construction, a little bit of farming, a little bit of ranching, and tourism. It's nine months, right? We're sitting here, we have nothing to do besides fix some parts for next year because there's nothing going on, right, in our business. But where, <laughs> who are you going to sell these to? And a 52,000 million income in Moab? I tell you what, I make a year and I can't, I can't afford to live here, and it's a lot more than that. I would have asked Mike. So, where, where, guys? We got, we've got to get some housing for people to come in there yeah. that are working out. I mean, and I can't even go to Grand Oasis and buy a double white to put my employees in anymore because it all has to be individually owned. I would do that, you know. But we're, 
at the, the intro and what it costs to live here. So you guys can do all the studies you want, but you need to do the studies and you need to know what it's going to cost and how much water it's going to take. But you're projecting all the, how many how many houses and how many people are going to be able to buy here, right? And live in those houses. You're projecting to either move them from the commercial corridor and out farther, but there's no one to put in, no one to afford to buy them. Who can afford to buy one in Moab? You live in a tiny house too, right? Correct. Yeah. I used to live in a 6,000 square foot house that was worth $185,000 years ago. Now, what that would cost me? In Moab? About $2 million for a house that ain't worth $240,000 anywhere else in the nation. So that's my point. Where, where are we going to we're going to put these people. Who's going to buy it? That's my thing. You can do all the studies in the world. You can keep pushing the studies out since 18 to 22. We have not solved anything, have we? So we need to pick one thing and solve it and get some housing and move on to the bigger point. And that's what we have to do as a community. I mean, we're tired of having... I had to hire three less employees this year because they had nowhere to live. Three, I could, I could employ three more people full-time. If they had nowhere to live, so I had to turn them down. Thank so that's my thing. Thank you. All right. Um, I'll comments. Is there a discussion? Okay. Well, have a wonderful holiday. And we'll see you back at the start of the year. Move to adjourn. <laughs>